Well, not forever. <laughs> Just the, uh, the series of one another's that we are dealing with. Um, we're looking at one more time at this subject of forgiveness. All right? So if I haven't stepped on your toes yet, most likely they will be crushed this morning. In a gentle, loving way, of course, right? Well, I feel the need to pray. Lord, I need you, right? And uh, let's join your hearts with me as I lift my voice up to the Lord again. Lord, I come to you again and just uh, pray that uh, you would move in our hearts, that uh, this is time of worshiping you by the hearing of the word of God. And so we are worshiping by hearing, but also worshiping by responding. And, and Lord, you, you have a purpose for our gathering right now. We, we need your word, and then we need to respond to it. And so I pray that you might have your way in all of our hearts, that we would learn uh, what it means to bear with one another and to forgive one another. And so direct my steps and direct um, this time. Give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are talking about the various one another's in the Bible. The last two weeks I've been dealing with this subject of forgiveness. Paul teaching here from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. In a moment I'm going to be reading it. But he says how we as believers ought to be, what we ought to be doing in our relationships with one another. And in particular, he's got the Jews and the Gentiles in mind. Okay, picture this now. Two different peoples who have been hostile to each other, right? Jews and Gentiles, they don't really get along. And now, through a miracle, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the calling of the Holy Spirit is making one body out of the two, right? Jews and Gentiles are no longer going to be two. They're going to be one people. And so now, how are we going to get along with each other? And so all these one another's are dealing with these two peoples becoming one. But that also applies to you and I, because though we might not have that animosity and a hostility with two people, Jews and Gentiles, becoming one, we also have baggage in our life, and, and we have our own things going on outside of church, and then we come in, and you know the one another's are best practice, not just coming on Sunday. It's easy to put a smile on your face and act like you're getting along with one another, right? <laughs> But let's have some small groups during the week and let's spend some more time together. Let's spend some more time together. Why don't we do that? Seriously. Not just on Sunday. Let's have some small groups. Let's somebody open up their home and let's have some activity going on during the week. And we'll see, you know, whoa, you do that? You like that? Oh, you're a Democrat? Oh, you're a Republican? Or you, oh, oh, you like Donald Trump? Oh, my God. Oh, my. And we're all Christians. Let's forget about those things, right? Let's love each other. How do we live together? Then we're going to see how these one another's apply. Am, am I speaking to the choir here? Or are you guys tracking what I'm saying? You, under, you understand what I'm saying? So this is what's important. We need to be the body of Christ. We need to be the church. And so Paul is addressing, addressing how do we have relationships with another? How do we bear with one another? How do we forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us? And so if you've been tracking with me, I define forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just saying I'm sorry, okay? It can be that. Depends on what the offense is, right? Forgiveness is a transaction that takes place. It begins in the heart. I have, I'm armed with forgiveness towards somebody, right? But the actual granting of that forgiveness is a transaction. That you're, you who have offended me have repented. You've confessed. You've told me that what you've done to me is wrong. You're sorry. Okay, I take that. You repented. You're wrong. You feel bad about what you did. And then the Bible says, I'm to forgive you, right? Forgiveness means that there's two aspects to it. I, 
I have, I'm armed with forgiveness toward every single person. The Bible says I'm to love my enemies, right? I'm to be armed with forgiveness. I'm to pray for those who, dis, who despite me and, and use me. Amen. Or owe me, right? I'm, a, I'm to have that attitude as a Christian toward other people. That forgiveness is ready. And I'm not, that's not easy to do, okay? So I'm armed with it, but it, there's, there's also the actual granting of it. But that granting doesn't take place, okay, until that person who's offended you comes to you and says, what I did was wrong, right? I repent. I'm sorry. And he says, forgive them. If they do it 70 times 7, if that's the way they're coming to you with that kind of repentance, then you are to forgive them. Now, obviously, there's other things that play into that. There's consequences for people's actions. There, there's, there, that doesn't mean you're automatically reconciled to them, Right? Because there's a trust thing that's been broken. And so there's things that need to be worked out. Forgiveness is granted, but that doesn't mean everything's back to being hunky-dory again, right? There's, there's reconciliation is the goal, but it takes time for that to happen. If the offense is small, there's no big deal, right? Then that's a lot easier. But if it's a serious matter, obviously that there's some things that play into that. And so we define forgiveness, but we also need to demonstrate it. What does it mean when, when I f- say I, f- I forgive you? It means a promise. I'm, I'm making promises to you. I'm saying to you that I'm not going to dwell on this incident anymore. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm saying to you I'm not going to bring it up to you again. I'm not going to bring it up and use it against you. I'm making a promise to you that I'm not going to talk to others about this incident. I'm not going to go and say, hey, buddy, could you pray for this guy? Right? but it's really gossip. I'm not going to talk to others about it. And then I'm opening up a pathway for reconciliation by not letting this incident, this offense, stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. That's what it means to forgive somebody. Uh, I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, that's not an easy thing to do. Are you with me? That's not an easy thing to do. You need Jesus to do that. You need Jesus to do that. You can say those words, but to actually live it out, you need Jesus. And that's what he's talking about in this passage. Because most importantly, when we say forgiveness, I forgive you, it's it's patterned after Christ's forgiveness toward us. And you know that's an act of grace. People don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve forgiveness. And so God in His grace through Jesus, forgave us because we put our trust in him. Amen? And so it's patterned after that. And we know forgiveness is not the end of the matter, as I already said. The, 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 the end of the goal is restoration. We want to reconcile, as the Bible says. Two parties have been at odds. How is all this possible? How is it possible? For some, as I said, all offenses toward us, it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's hard. It might be a serious offense that makes it really hard to forgive. So how can we do it? Well, listen to this statement. I'm going to say this a number of times. Forgiving others flows from our relationship with the Lord. Forgiving others flows with our, from, from our relationship with the Lord. So look at God's word, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, or on top of all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So what does God say about you and me? If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, He has given you your identity right here. 
He's calling you some things that you and I need to operate our life from. He is saying, number one, you are the elect of God. If you are one of God's children, if you've turned from your sin and you've put in your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, God knew you were going to do that. You might have done it 10 days ago, 20 days ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was. God says, I knew you were going to do that. Why? Because I chose you to do it. You are the elect of God. Elect of God means this. We are the called out ones. That's talking about the church as a corporate church. We are called out from this world, but also it is talking about individually because Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says that we are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You catch that? Before you were born, before you were even awake in your mother and father's eyes, God already knew when you were going to be saved because it says before the foundation of the world, he chose you. Now, do you understand that? Don't say yes. None of us understand that. Because somehow, someway, you still chose. I chose Jesus Christ. I put my trust in Him. Somehow, someway, God knew that was going to happen. The Bible says that you are elect of God. That's your identity. But it doesn't, all, it doesn't just say that. He also says that you're holy. You might not feel holy today. <laughs> holy means that you're pure, that you're righteous, that you have been given the righteousness of Christ, that you are separated from this world, that you are, in a sense, you're divine. You don't feel it, do you? But this is your identity. This is your position as a believer in the Lord. He says you're elect of God. He says that you are holy. And then he goes on to say that you are beloved. That's not just saying I love you. That's saying you're beloved. That's a special kind of love that God has for his children. He'll do whatever it takes to make you position, you're positionally holy, but he'll do whatever it takes to make you practical, practically holy in your way of living. That's how much he loves you. You are beloved. So you're elect of God, you are holy, and you're beloved. This is all true of you and me as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved, you're forgiven of your sins, but you are elect, you're holy, and you're beloved. That's a wonderful exalted position that God wants you to say to yourself. He wants you to feel that you are, that's who you are. This is your identity. In other words, before you are a male or a female, you are elect, holy, and beloved. Before you are Jew or Gentile, husband, wife, father, daughter, son, brother, whatever, before you are any of those titles or whatever you do for a living, your vocation, those are all important things. But before you're any of those things, you are elect of God. You are beloved and you are holy in God's eyes. That is who you are. God chose you. He made you holy. He loves you and he forgave you. And so we therefore ought to forgive one another. And if we don't, and if we don't, we are not allowing who we are to define how we behave. Did you catch that? We are elect, holy, and beloved. But if we don't allow who we are to, de, to, to give us the marching orders in the way that we live our life, we are not allowing who we are to dictate how we behave our lives. So that's why God wants you to be, be reminded of these things. This is who you are. A wonderful truth, and you can say amen to any one of those things if you wanted to. It ought to make you feel really special. And it, it's an exalted position. This is your status before God. And so you might mess up, you might sin, you might cut somebody off, you might not treat your kids the way you're supposed to treat them. You might have had a bad day, goodness gracious, probably a bad week of doing all kinds of things that you're probably ashamed of, come to church, oh man, I don't even feel like going to church, I'm a, I don't even feel like I'm even a Christian today, right? Well, let that, that get you down, because that's not who you are. Your identity is in Christ. You are in Christ. You are elect. You are loved. And you, you are holy. You are a child of God. Amen? I'll start you off. Y'all looking like a little sleepy out there. So as the elect of God, look at your Bible, 
tells you, he gives you a commandment. He says, put on. This is referring to who Christ has made us. He's made us new people. And in him, he says, so put on. And he lists a number of graces and virtues that ought to be flowing from your life and my life. He says, he's using language that, that you and I would use for like putting on clothes. You get up in the morning, you put on clothes, things that you wear, things that people see on your body. You wear these things. Back in verse 5 of chapter 3, he says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, upon which these things, the, son of, the, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves used to walk. These are the things that used to be on your body. You used to walk around in disobedience. Before you were a child of God, these are the things that people would see in your life. But when you became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, look at verse 10. And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who, was created, who created him. And so when you were an unbeliever, you had all these other things that, on the outside that people would see. But now he says, you have put on the new man. And so God wants us to walk in that new man. This is these qualities that he just mentioned in verse, back in verse 12 are the things that we should be known for as believers. Qualities, patterns of our life, the way we are living and walking in our life. Tender mercies, that's compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. The, these five things are to come out of our lives, and we are to put them on for others to see. Our brothers and sisters ought to be seeing these things in our life. Now, here's the question for you. How are these qualities, these graces, how are they to be seen in our life? Well, I'm going to tell you. They're to be seen through our bearing with one another. They're to be seen through our forgiving one another. We show, tracking with me, we show that we are putting on the tender mercies and the kindness and humility and the long suffering. We show that we are putting on these things by bearing with one another, by forgiving one another. One another. You know, if, you think, if you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, I, I can't live this way. I can't live these qualities. I can't be a forgiving and bearing person unless I am putting on something that is not natural to my body, that's not natural to my life. Unless I put these things on, I can't be a forgiving, loving, and bearing person. Person. And so I need to put these things on. I need to put them on. And so the question is, where do they come from? They're not natural to us. It's not something you wake up with and you have unless, go back to verse 10, because these are not natural. Before we can put these things on, he mentions in, that he mentions in verse 12, so that others can see him on the outside. Something needs to happen on the inside so that we can put on what he wants us to wear. And what is that in verse 10? He says, and have put on the new man. I want you to do some study in here. Look at verse 10. There's a difference between 10 and 12. He says, and have put on. In verse 12, he says, and you put on. The difference is this. There's one talking about past tense, and there's one talking about present tense. And verse 12 is talking presently. But you can't presently put on the tender mercies and the kindness and the humility and the long-suffering unless you first have put on the new man that he's talking about in verse 10. And that's all talking about salvation. As you sit here this morning... If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a wonderful and marvelous work has happened in your life. God has put in you a new man. That's created. This new man is created in the image of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in every single believer. 
And therefore, if you have the new, new man that, by the way, needs to be renewed, it says there in verse 10, through the knowledge of him. And how does that happen? Through the word of God, right? Right? You need to be renewing this image through the word of God daily, struggling to get the word of God in your life. That's what he talks about there in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so the new man, you and I have so much ability, the capacity to be all that God wants us to be because we have the new man. And who is that new man? Jesus. Think about the qualities he just mentioned. Tender mercies, right? Kindness, humility, meekness, longs. Who is this person that we're to put on? Class. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So all the songs, and Michaela didn't really know where I was going with this message, all the songs that we sang are all about trust, right? Surrendering. You want Jesus to be seen by the world, by your brothers and sisters, as you are offended by somebody. And then you gotta, so you got to humble yourself, show kindness and mercy, and maybe bear and, and be patient with people and forgive them. Wow. How can you do that without Jesus, class? You can't. It's all superficial without Jesus. You need Jesus. And so Jesus does his wonderful work in our lives. He he gives us the ability to love people enough to forgive them and not dwell on the offense, just like the Lord does for us, amen? Just like he's done for us. It's a gift of God. And what does it do? It flows out of a personal relationship that we have with the Lord. Amen? It flows out of that relationship. You and I need to have a strong relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in order for this stuff to flow out of our life. This is what Corey Ten Boom learned. Uh, she could not, for, couldn't love the person who tortured her. She was tortured. Her family was killed. The, and, and, and how can she forgive this individual? Well, Christ gave her the ability to forgive this man. And so when you get up in the morning, before you put your feet on that floor, when you're putting on maybe your shorts or whatever, your T-shirt, just kind of in your mind as an image, you're putting on that shirt or that robe, just pray. I want to put on the tender mercies of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I need you today. I need to be merciful. Lord Jesus, I need to be kind. Lord Jesus, I need to be Humble, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Lord Jesus, I need to be patient because I know today something might happen. I don't know, you do, right? That I need to be this towards somebody today. Maybe you got into an argument the night before and and you're going to see that person because you live with them, right? And so, man, I'm not going to just wait for that person to come to me. I'm going to show Christ and I'm going to start this day off right. Amen? Just nod your heads, we get done faster. Amen. And so, forgiving others flows from our relationship with the Lord. It has to. There's no other way of doing it. Now, I'm going to step on some toes now. There are two other places that the Lord tells us that forgiving others flows out of our relationship with the Lord. In other words, whether we are walking with Him the way we ought to or we're not walking with Him, or maybe our lack of forgiveness towards somebody else is because we don't even know the forgiveness of God ourselves. Amen? Or oh me, right? And so, if I, if I refuse, very important word, if I refuse to forgive somebody, my very status or my position with God, relationship-wise, is in question. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I am saying your relationship with God is in question if you're refusing to Forgive somebody. Now, refuse and struggle, two different words. If I'm standing like this and I'm refusing to forgive somebody, I'm not going to do it, right? That's happened. It's kind of childish, but it's happened, right? Or um, I, I, I desire to be what Christ wants me to be. I desire it, but I'm struggling. I'm like... Corey Tenbo, I can't get my hand up to do it. I can't. 
can't forgive. I, I want to, but I can't. There's a big difference. In Matthew, you can turn to this if you want to. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus, and, and, and teaching us how to pray, 612. Matthew 612. Jesus told us when we're praying, in, our, in the Lord's Prayer, he says, and when you're praying, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Remember that part of the prayer? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now think about this. Do we really want that prayer to come true? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do we really want that prayer to come true? Do you want the Lord to forgive you as you are forgiving other people? That's the better question. Yes and no, right? It all depends on how well you're doing in forgiving people. If you are refusing to forgive somebody, you don't want that prayer to come true because the, the Lord's not forgiving you. You tracking with me? Just nod your heads, right? So if we are forgiving others, then we can pray that prayer, forgive me as I forgive my debtors. You tracking? In the same breath, in verses 14 and 15, listen to what Jesus says. For if you forgive other people, in verse 14 and 15, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Watch. But if you do not forgive other, there's others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ooh, what does he mean by that? So I'm saying... I'm arguing with you this morning that forgiveness flows from our relationship with God. I can forgive because he forgave me. If I cannot forgive someone from, for offending me, there's something wrong with my relationship with the Lord. I can't pray, Father, forgive me as I forgive others, right? But what does he mean when he says, if you don't forgive your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Now, obviously, or at least in my understanding, since my forgiveness with God is not based on my good works, it's not based on my good life, I can't earn it, I don't deserve it, I can't do anything to get God's forgiveness. So if I have forgiveness with God, it's not based on anything I've done, it's based on what Christ has done for me. Then my forgiveness with God is not conditioned, it's not conditioned on my behavior, but on what Christ has done for me. That we need to understand, okay? So when Jesus says, neither will your Father forgive you if you have not forgiven someone else, it must mean, not that I lose my forgiveness that I have in order to get into heaven, I'm losing my salvation, it must mean that I am Losing forgiveness that I need to be in a right relationship with Him. You tracking with me? So there is a difference. This goes back to our understanding of relationship and fellowship. I will, if I'm a child of God, I am always in a relationship with God. He is my Father. Amen? I can't lose that. I cannot lose my salvation. But I can lose my fellowship with God. I will never lose my relationship with Him. But that relationship could be a good one or it could be a bad one depending on how I'm dealing with my sin of refusing to forgive somebody. You tracking with me? He promises to forgive my sins if I confess them. 1 John 1, 9. But if I'm confessing my sins to the Lord... And I'm not willing to forgive somebody. Am I really confessing them? No, I'm not. Very, very important. And so forgiveness is based on my relationship with the Lord. I must therefore maintain my fellowship with the Lord so I am walking with Him. I can live it out. The one and others of the Bible. I need to be a forgiving person. I might not have given forgiveness to somebody, it's not because I'm refusing to give it to you. Maybe you haven't asked for it, or maybe it's because I'm just struggling, right? And so let's go back to that example with Corey Ten Boom. 
she couldn't forgive the man who she knew was a part of her family's death, right? And her torture. She, she had a hard time doing it. But she knew that if Christ had forgiven him, then who was she? Not to also forgive this person. So what did she do? Well, she prayed twice, it says in her testimony. As this man, who she knew was her torturer, came up to her and extended his hand to her and, and basically said, I am a child of God, I, I've, I've, I'm amen in everything you're saying, right? And as he extended her hand to her, she tried to extend hers, but she couldn't, it says. And she said this to, silently she prayed, Lord Jesus, forgive me and help me to forgive him. That was the first time she prayed. And then she says, I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest bit of warmth or charity toward this individual. She was not able to put on the tender mercies of Christ, his kindness, and his humility. She couldn't do it. And so again, what did she do? She prayed again silently. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. And then she said this, give me your forgiveness. Now that could be translated in two different ways. It could be asking him for forgiveness again, or it could be more of a possessive thing. Give me your, capital Y, your forgiveness. Because if we're armed, because we're supposed to forgive as Christ has forgiven us, amen? And so if we're armed with, if we have an understanding of his forgiveness toward us, and we're able, we're armed with that forgiveness, capital Y, your forgiveness, that I'm able to forgive somebody else who I know doesn't deserve it because I didn't deserve it. You tracking with me? And so she realized at that moment that when she trusted in the Lord to forgive the person through her, she was able to forgive him with the forgiveness that she was given by Jesus. She was able to put on the tender mercies of Christ, the kindness, the humility, the long-suffering. She was able to put it on at that moment. Why? Because she trusted it in the Lord and she called out to him for his ability to do it. And that's what it means as a Christian to put on the tender mercies, the kindness, the humility, and the long-suffering to be able to forgive somebody. You need to call out to the Lord. You need to ask him. Give me your forgiveness. Now, sometimes we're already walking in the Spirit, right? We're already trusting the Lord. We are walking in the will of the Lord, and that offense might come, and it's like, you know what? This is easy, right? Because you already got the power of the Holy Spirit. It's enabling. But sometimes you might come off, catch you off guard, and you might not be able to do it, or it might be such a bad offense that was towards you that it's taking you time. You're struggling through it. There's pride in your heart and life, and you need to surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not able to forgive this person, but I know you want me to, right? You want me to be Jesus to everybody? Love my enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Pray for that person. And so pray for them. Pray for your own heart. Pray for your own life. Forgiveness flows from our relationship with the Lord. So if you're having a hard time forgiving someone, even bearing with them, perhaps you are, con you are not connecting your forgiveness with the forgiveness that the Lord has given to you. You're not connecting it. You're not connecting the forgiveness that you've received. Maybe you need to once again look at what Christ has done for you. Maybe you can't forgive because you are not looking to the Lord for His grace and His strength, and you need to do that. Maybe it's because you've forgotten who you are. You are the elect of God. You are holy. You are beloved. This is who you are. And so let, that, let, it, let who you are come out of your life and live the way Christ has called you to live. So may we all seek the Lord in that moment, in that moment, and say to him, give me 
your forgiveness. I need it so I can give it to somebody else. If you're here this morning and that's something that you're struggling with, because I, I know a personal experience, sometimes it's hard. And I've talked to people. And I know what people are going through. Maybe you're here this morning and that's something that you've been struggling with. Well, I don't just work on Sunday. I'm available during the week if you need to meet with me. But reach out. Even while you're sitting where you're sitting right now, would you pray? Ask the Lord to help you to forgive that person, to be armed with forgiveness, to be ready to forgive that person, and to be Christ to somebody. Walking around with the tender mercies, the kindness, the humility, the long-suffering, and you're ready. You have the armor of God. You have it on. You're ready. Amen? Would you all bow your heads and let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the truth of thy word today and teaching us about who we are and how we can forgive and how important it is to maintain our relationship with you. Maybe there's someone here this morning that's never turned from their sin and put their trust in you. They know about you. They're religious. Maybe you think they're a good person. But they've never turned from their sin and trusted you to be their savior to save them from the judgment to come. There's a judgment to come and our good works and our good behavior and all the good things we've done in our life are not going to save us from that judgment. Only Jesus can. And Jesus won't save us unless we turn from our sin and trust Him to be our Savior. And so I, I ask you, Lord, to use that in people's lives right now. Maybe there's someone here today that has never received the forgiveness of God and therefore they can't forgive somebody else because they don't have His forgiveness. Oh, God. Right now, where they're seated, seated, would they call out to you and ask you to forgive them, to be their Savior, and come into their life right now. And I pray for everyone here today, Lord, that we would be your chosen ones, your holy ones, your loved ones. And may the world, starting here in this church and all around us, see all the tender mercies, the kindness, the humility, the long-suffering that you want us to put on display by forgiving and bearing with one another. And this I pray in your precious Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing unto the Lord. You love my heart to death. It's taken What? 